So we've got a, uh, someone from the Air Force here, so are, are we going to be talking about getting planes out the door? Absolutely. All it's right. It begins and it. ends with rubber on the ramp and satellites in the sky. There you go. So, uh, Colonel, just to get everybody familiar here, uh, let's start off, uh, who are you, what do you do? Thank you. Appreciate that. Let me first off say thank you so much to Governor Exec and Defense One for having me. What a great opportunity and what a wonderful venue to do this in. My name is Tom Rock and I have the absolute pleasure of being part of the Space and Missile Systems Center in one of the new offices known as Portfolio Architect. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, why it's important as we get to this very basic conversation about how do we manage during crisis, how do we manage in uh, changing priorities. What I do in the Portfolio Architect Office is that I am helping support the transition of the enterprise from a very stovepiped, how do we do specific space services that we're used to doing, such as GPS, such as military satellite communications, into the enterprise approach of how do I actually provide position, navigation, and timing? How do I provide military SATCOM? How do I provide tactical intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance? As well as how do I provide the enterprise services that go along with those? Think, how do I provide a data transport layer through space, through the ground, et cetera? How do I provide the enterprise approach of the underlying data architecture? How do we actually create the data fusion to allow us to be in the fourth uh, industrial re re revolution, excuse me, instead of maintaining the third as we go forward with it? That's so, what I'm excited about being. So as you talk about those things, uh, for the technical people in the crowd, I'm sure they can, they can make the linkages. But for people who may not be familiar with, with all of the, uh, the military speak and some of the technical speak, what does that mean for the soldiers, for the civilians, for the people that you serve within the military? What do you do for them? So fundamentally, what we do, and the reason why I'm so impassioned and so excited about being in the military and doing this, is we provide the ability to access the data and give them usable solutions to the problems that the warfighters provide. For example, one of the vignettes, and I'll use that term often in today's discussion, is what am I actually able to do to make that soldier's job easier, to make that seaman's job a little bit easier, to make that um, Coast Guardsman's job easier? How do I provide space-based effects to, through, and from space to allow them to have the access to the data? Hey, I need spot-on communications to allow me to communicate with my headquarters so they can bring in a Reaper and the fires that they bring from above. Hey, I need to be able to rescue my downed crewmen Who's, who uh, was attacked, hit, and I now have to go do combat search and rescue associated. We provide the fusion, we provide the insight, we provide the data systems to allow them to be able to make decisions at an operational level mm -hmm. as well as the tactical level to fundamentally allow us to achieve the objectives laid out by our civilian leadership. Excellent, excellent. So uh, we will leave some time for, for questions toward the end of this, uh, and, and so start thinking of those now. Uh, but what I want to dig into is what kind of changes you all are going through in the military, in the Air Force, and specifically with what you're doing with regard to space. And space, I imagine, is probably one of the biggest areas of change for the military today. It's a, it's a new war fighting domain, and it's, how has the, uh, the administration's push for a space force and space command and, and rethinking about space as a war fighting domain, how's that changed the way you operate? So I appreciate the open-ended question and allow me to get into uh, a couple, three areas as we do that. The first off is the leadership of our nation is, by defining it as a warfighting domain, has allowed us to more upfront, more transparently, have a conversation with industry, with our allies, with our partners about how do we actually want to defend and protect our assets in space. What that particularly means is that I'm now able to enter partnerships, I'm now enter, able to enter agreements on how to better bring and cull and use the forces that are out there. And I say that because the partnership with our allies to be able to use their satellite systems, the uh, partnerships with industry to allow us to take advantage of their images, be it synthetic aperture, uh, radar images versus electro-optical via all the other intelligence type activity. How do we actually bring that to bear and provide that into a common operating picture at our coalition-based theater command and control centers, to our coalition troops, to our allies, to our partners, et cetera. So what it really allows us to do by the administration making that domain is allow us to bring all of the warfighting skills and all of the other domains to bear so that I can have a very plain conversation with industry that says, I need to be able to solve this problem. And I'll give you a good example. In the near-peer environment that we're moving into uh, and that we're, uh, that we're getting ready to more prepared to fight, the question always comes out, how do I handle an anti-access area denial environment? Well, so, again, for the non-military people in the audience, what, is, what does that mean? So what that really means is when you have enough 
air defense systems that I cannot fly a traditional fighter platform, electronics platform, et cetera, into that environment. That's called area, uh, anti-access area denial, where their systems force our our forces to be so far off the coast of country X that I can no longer use my traditional systems, they're out of range. Very simply, my, uh, my signals can't reach to where I want to go, nor can I receive the information back on how to go forward. Mm -hmm. That anti-access area denial environment is overcome by the fundamental fact that space is the high ground. You cannot actually prevent us from overflying you unless you start taking out those satellites. And so in the new environment, now that space is considered a warfighting domain, we now have the ability to respond and take action to if one of our satellites is actually taken out. Now what those choices are and how the policymakers want to deal with that, well that's the, that's the beauty of our civilian-led leadership that allows uh, the policy to come down that way. My job and the job of the Air Force is to provide courses of action on how to respond to such an attack and how to prevent, mitigate, and fundamentally be able to continue the mission despite an impact on one of those satellites overhead. Mm. So I know you have uh, more points to talk about within that, that list that you were saying sure. about the space, but I wanted to dig in on that one briefly here. So you mentioned that, that the civilian brass, they're going to have to decide on what those policies are and all that. So I won't, I won't ask you to, to try to set Defense Department policy. but those policies aren't set yet, right? And you're still in, the, the, the world keeps turning, time keeps moving on. So how are you managing right now at a time where you have certain mandates to move forward, but the final policies aren't necessarily set? You're, you're in, you're in a, a state of flux. How are you managing your office, your people, your mission through that? A great question that deserves a more delicate and sophisticated answer than I'm prepared to give you. <laughs> and I say that not because it's a little bit more akin to the wild, wild west, where right now doing something will help define a lot of the policy and understanding what the implications are. It's a little bit of the fly, test, fix type of mentality, DevSecOps in the IT environment that says, let's actually get with our partners, let's actually go do something and see what happened well and what happened poorly and recover from that. Mm -hmm. That transition, that mentality is part of the culture that the earlier speakers brought up is really where the mantra of how the Air Force is going and getting after that one. Because there is not policy on there, let's actually go find out what works and what doesn't work, much as in the early days of the Air Force when we were trying to break the sound barrier. What works, what doesn't work. And the F, you know, the uh, 100 series fighters back in the day where we tried many, many, many things. Mm -hmm. We're doing that now with our acquisition environments. We're doing that with our software factories, both uh, on the East Coast with Kessel Run and West Coast with um, Surf Camp, as well as in Colorado Springs with Space Camp, where we're actually building those test environments to allow us to define what can we do with an underlying data architecture? What can we do with the apps to allow us to understand if I get an attack a physical, cyber, uh, other means attack on one of our systems, here are the full courses of action that I can present to the leadership. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's what the job is. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what are you finding as you're running these, you're working with Kessel Run and, and uh, the, uh, uh, the camps? What, what kind of new ideas, innovations, what are they coming up with? So foundationally, the ability to have this conversation really is a testament to how far we've come from as recently as 2017, when we were very much in the traditional stovepipe of these are the services that space provides to the warfighter. And as a result of setting up these camps and changing that mindset, we're actually able to adopt and have a better conversation with industry to say, what can we share? We have unique problem sets that are so interesting to the commercial market, and they have great solutions that are able to be handled on the big data environment. So when you merge those two together, you get a wonderful symmetry and synergy that says, hey, can you actually tell me what's going on with this particular island in the Pacific or this particular attack venue? How would you solve that problem? So what the camps are providing us is an environment to say, hey, here's my vignette that I want you to solve. What are the specific tool sets that you would bring to bear? What is the data that I need to bring to bear? And how do I merge those together to get not only the right information to see if it works right, but also the solution that is actionable? So what advice can you give those in the audience here who uh, might be at an AG, might, might be at a Department of Defense, you know, one of the services, they might be in the civilian side uh, with one of those agencies. If they're looking to set up something like that, what have you seen that works? What have you seen that doesn't work? What advice can you give them about setting up those camps and those labs? 
It's a great question. And the fundamental thing that you have to begin and end with, and you'll hear me stop foot a couple of times on this one, is you have to free the data to allow the information sharing across the agencies, across the departments, across the different collective camps that have all of this information on there. And then you have to present it to industry in an environment where they can do something with it in an unclassified world. Mm. With that foundation of shared data and shared access to that data appropriately monitored and the rest of that, you then get to this heart of your question is what are the lessons learned? And the biggest thing you have to be willing to do is get back in the mentality that was lost in the late 90s, early 2000s where it had to be perfect the first time or else you were never getting another dollar. And that open mining aperture, let's go back to the wild, wild west. Let's go back to the days of the 100 series fighters. Let's go back to the right stuff days where we were willing and, and tolerable to a mistake or two as long as it advanced and it wasn't a dumb safety concern or something like that. Mm. Fundamentally, you have to understand what risk you're taking and why you're taking them. That mentality is shut down a lot. And speaking very plainly, mm. I call it the re environment of the research and development world after the shackles of sequestration have been lifted. Now I can think longer term. Now I can think beyond uh, what does it take to get through today's meal and I get that security of, hey, I actually want to invest in what is machine to machine and, and artificial intelligence actually give me. Mm -hmm. I want to invest in an AWS stack and the relationship with the IC community to bring a $600 million investment to bear across all of government to allow me to have safe, secure computing. Mm -hmm. That wasn't available beforehand because we didn't, have, we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. Yeah, yeah. Now, if we could drill into some of that uh, data architecture, because that is in, sure. your, in your title there, what kind of architecture do you need to enable that sharing? Is there a way to uh, bring down those silos, share that information in an unclassed way that is safe, and automate that process, or is it still very heavily a person in the mix, you know, with a marker redacting and, and doing all that work? So the smartest way to answer that question is an example. And so right now we created a unified data library that began in late 2017, early 2018, where we were able to incorporate all of the space surveillance network data into a unified data library. Mm -hmm. This incorporated all of the ground-based sensors looking up at space, all of the tracking that was going on. And so Air Force Space Command and the shops at, uh, within SMC made a conscious decision to say, let's do this smartly and create that data environment where I can share it, not on a single dedicated pipe from point A to point B, not a hub and spoke environment, but rather how do I take advantage of the mesh technology in the, in the current state because we weren't beholden to some of the legacy systems that were already out there. Mm. So we created the system known as a unified data library and we were able to demonstrate that to Corona, which is Air Force speak for all the senior leadership of the services coming together to talk about operationally relevant problems. And so what we presented was, how do I distribute data? How do I show it in an easy to understand vignette across several different theater command and control locations, as well as manipulate raw data coming in and doing something with it, solving or beginning to solve two vignettes as we go forward with it. Your specific question about how did I free the data to allow that to happen really comes down to the data storefront that we created, which has a combination of multi-level security as well as secured access points on there, so that while it's not redacted as to what, you can, uh, what is in the data, what is redacted is what access you have permission to go see. So it's just about role-based? Uh, very access, much. It's yeah. role-based, uh, very much a role-based access point on that. And the nice part about this data architecture is, is you as the data owner can determine who should have access and who should not have access to that. That ability and the architecture to allow us to do that has really been the key to our success of solving these very difficult problems in a way that we can share the data. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at that, and I started with that about each of the camps, that's really the key is to say, once you have the ability to present data that is unclassified, I can then ship it off to our coalition partners. I can then make it accessible to our industry and academia to allow them to solve these problems. And while the digits may be off one or two, they may be representative, they may not be actual data, the algorithms that are being created is really the heart and that's really the measure of merit now as we go forward with. Mm -hmm. I want to assess combat power using what data algorithms can be to bear. The sensors themselves are interesting, but now with the proliferation of the commercial world, a lot of those sensors are being augmented by the commercial environment. Mm -hmm. Bring me your best data algorithm 
to allow me to solve these technical problems and you'll become my, cust uh, my provider of choice. Excellent. I want to get back to the, the industry stuff you're doing because I know there's some other interesting points in there, but uh, just to stay on the, the data sharing for a second. This, you're doing something different, something new. Uh, that, that's always scary. Government isn't necessarily good at doing uh, those kind of scary changes. How are you managing the, the change management aspect? Uh, for Are you seeing a lot of data huggers and people who just don't want to share? And how are you getting around that? The answer is yes. We are seeing a lot of data huggers, and I'm going to walk away with that being my learning point as the previous speaker talked about. I had not thought about that one. So as you walk away with free the data is your mantra for my speech, fundamentally the way we get around it is you start to present an operational vignette and you showcase this is what we're able to do with the problems set. Here's the data and here's the way we manage it. And the heart of that is really a conscientious, purpose-built strategy document that says how do we want to do our data management? How do we want to do enterprise data management? And we've been stealing plagiarizing from other agencies and Space Command put a fairly good one together. And ultimately what that allows us to do is gain the trust in the system, much like you have trust in Uber and Waze and the other apps because you had a chance to take them out and take them for a spin. That's what we're doing with our data systems. Yeah. How do I actually understand, hey, did you protect this piece of information? Am I seeing it being leaked out inappropriately? By building that trust, I'm then able to start having a more professional, less passionate argument about, here's how we're going to share your data, here how it's going to be protected, and more importantly, here's what you gain from that relationship where you gain 10 times what you risk. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So when we, when we talked before the, the, pan, the, the discussion here, Sounded like you're, in a way, a victim of your own success, though, because you have all of these PNT services that you offer uh, and that data that you can offer. The uh, uh, but sure. you're getting more requests than you can handle at this point. Is that an accurate way to put it? I think the short answer is the enemy has a vote, and you're really seeing us respond to the threat and that changing environment that says. Hey, everybody in the world understands that the United States is the best in all domains now because of our services and because of our ability to integrate the data across all of the domains. When you start taking a look at where are we the most vulnerable, where are the areas that are the least protected, well, the one that was never considered a warfighting domain is probably a good one to start. Mm -hmm. So as they look at the attacks on our space systems, as you start looking at the threats in our environment, we are being forced to change and that change is difficult, that change is important, that change is relevant, but because we've had the success, it really has given us the confidence though, that we're gonna make the change. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we did not have the trappings of some of the history that some of the more, uh, that the other domains had. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are able to take a step forward because we've never had a data strategy before. We had never needed one. Right. Therefore, we're able to reach out and take the current industry best practices, bring that to bear, and build off of those. So you don't while, have that base of bad habits already. Correct, I don't have to correct bad habits as I go forward with it. And more importantly, I have an environment that's set up because there's a threat very close in my face that I need to do something different. Mm -hmm. Combine that with the relieving the shackles of sequestration, and I'm able to actually bring the best talent that our nation, that our partners, that our allies have in play to bear. And this is a great, easy to understand example because mm -hmm. I can share it out in the open now. Yeah, so how are you working with industry? Because this is one of the things that, that we've talked about before was that there's, throughout the, the services, everybody wants a piece of what you offer. They all need that, that location data, that, that, that reconnaissance data and all that stuff. Um, do you have the resources to meet all that demand? And how has that demand increased over time? So the short answer is we're obviously never going to be resourced at the level that we are the most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, the triage that we're going through is forcing us to change the way we view the problem. And that sparks the change as we go forward with it. And fundamentally, what Space and Missile Systems Center has done is it's rewickered, rethought about how we attack the problem set entirely and gone from those individual stovepipes to an enterprise approach. And what we're doing is refocusing, changing how those assets and resources are being applied into a much more enterprise level focus. Mm. So that when I think about each of the core capabilities that we provide, position navigation and timing, um, uh, missile warning, uh, MILSATCOM, et cetera, you start to see several common themes across all of them, and we start to manage across those common themes. Mm -hmm. In each of those areas, I need to be able to task it, I need to be able to collect the data, I need to be able to process the data, I need to exploit it, and I need to disseminate it. Well, if I'm gonna do that, now I have six different product lines doing the same thing, 
What's my enterprise approach as I go forward with it? And that's what's new. And that's really the essence of what will be culminated here at the end of this calendar year with SMC 2.0 becoming just SMC is that enterprise level that says, here's how I want to do data management, here's how I want to do transport layer, here's the way I want to do launch across all vehicles, all types. Mm -hmm. It's that big viewpoint that says, how do I bring these services, how do I bring these capabilities beyond the individual stovepipes? Mm -hmm. That's really the heart of the design. Now your question was, how are we in, uh, interacting with industry? And I want to highlight two things very quickly and take some questions as appropriate sure. is, the first is we set up a other transaction authority to allow us to bring in just under 300 different industry partners, most of which, 90% of which, are not the traditional big partners that you're used to dealing with the DOD industry. And that so, has been tremendous. Yeah, everybody here generally familiar at this point with OTA? Do we need a quick part of that? Everybody's, okay. Sort of the WMD consortium and all, or separate? It's Spec OTA is the one I'm talking about right now. Uh, and so that's Spec OTA is fundamentally, we keep having to raise the limit because it's been so valuable and so appropriate and bring in so many unique and interesting ideas to allow us to jump ahead. The second idea, and this really gets to the idea of where you're seeing space influence the Air Force and, and the Air Force influencing space is with the pitch days. And I know that there was one la, uh, la, earlier this year up in New York, and then we just conducted ours up in San Francisco area on the 5th and 6th of November where we awarded 30 contracts on the spot for a total of 750 k to new vendors, new type of folks. And we like so much of them, we even went a couple million dollars for a few of them to go further. This is the way we're changing the way we interact with government to get those small folks that have the best ideas or great ideas that just need a chance to go on. This is how I get the diversity of thought that is so critical to our nation's success. Yeah, everybody talks about going fast with contracting. You all, if I'm right, it's something like there's a pitch and 10, 15 minutes later you're signing the Absolutely. contract. It was, it was 20 minutes when you walked away with the check in hand and LinkedIn blew up over that whole example to show this is what acquisition used to be like back in Bernard, General Bernard Shever's days when it was on the back of an envelope signed out and you went from there. We're starting to see that same comfort and understanding as to what that brings you. The end of the day, are you willing to walk away with an investment, I'll even use a million dollars where it's just wrong, but you learn something. Hmm. How much time have we spent in the contracting cycle to get that million dollars set up that at least all I did was exercise the bureaucracy versus finding out whether the solution was right or wrong. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a win from the very beginning. Yeah, nobody goes faster than the Air Force, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, one of the things, you know, we've been talking about data, again, you're, you're a data architect, that's what you do. When we talk about these, this OTA work and this fast contracting and, and trying to you know, fail fast if you're gonna fail, how important is it that you've been able to free up the data? Would it be possible to do these things if those vendors couldn't get secure access to the data they need? So fundamentally what you're really talking about is do you want to enter in the fight of your life with one hand tied behind your back? And I use that analogy because if I don't understand the context that the data was generated, if I don't understand the context of what the parameters were and fundamentally don't understand what I want to do with the data, I'm never going to be able to be successful. And I'll give you a good example of that. And that is, there's been a few examples where some of our legacy satellite systems are very, very well known and a sensor will go out. Because we share the data associated with that, we realize that the parameters and the understanding of the other sensors around mm -hmm. and included in that satellite can pick up the space, uh, you know, can understand what's missing and provide you that same information. That mosaic to fill in the gaps. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I use it, being from California, I can use a Star Wars example, and I keep thinking of uh, one of the prequels where Yoda was talking to Anakin Skywalker that says, it's supposed to be there. It's not there. Well, let's go find out why it's not there. And as you look at it, it should be there. The data was removed. It was erased. That same analogy holds true to say, because I've shared the data, because I understand the environment well enough, because I've shared the data, I can find out what was mistaken, what was pulled out, what was gone, so that I can understand what's truly not there or what is there when it's not there on the screen. So I have some more questions just about the threats and how you're handling those, but wanted to open it up to the audience as well. Uh, anybody out here have any questions? We got one right yes, ma'am. Uh, we got a microphone coming for you. Is there a Courtney Albin with Inside Defense? Um, you talked a little bit about uh, transitioning from the stovepipe mindset to a more enterprise um, 
way, way of managing these uh, mission areas. Um, in that process, uh, I imagine maybe you've, you've identified some duplication or areas um, where you might need to eliminate or combine efforts. Can you talk about maybe specific examples of dupl duplication that you've identified and what you're doing to address that? So, great question, and there's two or three examples. I'm trying to give you the crispest one is the reason why I'm pausing for just a moment on here. What you're really seeing is a transition of how do we provide a data layer across the space environment, and who should lead, how should we engage, et cetera. And I'll use the example that we're having with Blackjack, a, tar a DARPA-led program that is very much in favor by the space uh, or SDA and senior leadership here. And what is the changing role? What makes sense as we go forward with it? From an operational perspective, I don't care who provides it. I just need the service and um, capability provided as we go forward with it. As a Space and Missile Systems Center, I know that regardless of what happens, I'm gonna end up needing to be able to stitch that into the current systems and make sure that I plan for them as they go forward with it. As a result of that, and this is the elimination of duplication, we've adjusted some of the programs to better reflect the department's focus, and more importantly, stop trying to compete with ourselves, but rather understand these are the interfaces and this is the way we're gonna stitch that environment in. That's true in so many other areas, as well as how do I do space domain awareness? How do I do sharing of military SATCOM channels? How do I do all of these other areas where as SMC takes on the role of stitching together all of these capabilities and providing that end-to-end -end life cycle and that, that approach is really where you start to see, if I think about it from an enterprise perspective, I'm able to gain these efficiencies, which allows me to live within the total obligation authority, but also allows me to free up these resources to then focus on how do I do better data exploitation and build those data algorithms. So I answered your question a little bit more obliquely because I can't point out to say we closed this shop because it was duplicative, but rather what we've done is altered some of the strategies, altered the focus, and fundamentally took a mindset of, I need to be the integration of this great framework that's being created and stop being fascinated by the individual ornaments that hang off that framework. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Um, can you talk about some of the programs that have had their like, altered strategies or where some of that is coming from? So the short answer is it's a good 10-minute discussion on each one to truly understand that as well as I'm not, uh, I'm going to stray into areas that are not appropriate to talk in an open environment on some of that. Uh, uh, think missile warning and things like that is really where you see a lot of that effort going on. Uh, great question. Let's have another. Yeah. Any other questions, Adam? Yes, sir. This gentleman up here, right? Uh, Mike's right behind you. Uh, I'm Eric Larson from GAO. I had a question about how you manage relations with um, other entities up in space, like the Chinese, the Russians, the North Koreans, all of whom are carrying out various activities and. You know, you don't want to sabotage one or the other because they'll do it back to you. And I don't want to get into anything classified. I just am curious if you have any comment on that. So foundationally, and the key to all of this, and, and I'll use a cyber example because it's a very, very close parallel to it, and it's attribution. And the real question is, do I have the ability to attribute this specific action to be able to understand whether it is a a machinery malfunction, a malfunction, excuse me, a software malfunction, or is it actually an attack, and how do I attribute it to not only the country of origin, but the reason it was being done? To me, that's the level I'll get into with this conversation, but that fundamental core concept of, now that I know who's doing it and why they're doing it, I can then present to the leadership chain, what are the courses of actions on how we want to respond on that one? I'd like to dig into a, to one particular threat that I think is interesting. You know, I can imagine a couple of obvious ones, say uh, a physical threat to satellites, right, out, out, out there, uh, hacking attempts and the like. What about GPS uh, deepfake? The idea that uh, you could alter the data that you are collect, the data that you're collecting could be altered and, and unreliable. How are you managing that? So the specific techniques, tactics, and procedures, I'm certainly not going to get into here. But the idea and concept that says, how do we do data accuracy? How do I verify it? How I validate it? How do I bring in inputs? How do I ensure that my, my architecture has enough resiliency to be able to overcome that? 
is fundamentally the same questions that's being asked in the finance industry. Hmm. How do I handle Bitcoin? How do I handle those other algorithms and the other checkbook analogies to allow me to say, yes, this transaction happened or this transaction did not happen? So you're saying the answer is blockchain? I would say the blockchain philosophy and understanding and the changing the way we do security is an appropriate way to start th expanding how we solve that problem hmm. set. That's what I'm offering at this conversation. All right, excellent. Any more questions out here? All right then. Colonel Rock, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure and thank you to the team.